But what we have here in modernism, if we ask the metaphysical question, what is the nature of reality? What's real and what's not real? How do we tell the difference between truth and fantasy? Right? What's just made up, right? imaginary worlds or fictional worlds from real, actual reality? And the basic answer that the moderns give is a realist answer or a naturalist answer. The world is basically and fundamentally the natural world. There might also be a god, and we're open to arguing for it, and many of the moderns did believe in God, but they had a rational understanding of God and believed that you had to argue for the existence of God. And you had to argue for it first on the basis of a very good understanding of the way the natural world works. So we're going to start with the natural world and see where that takes us. Epistemologically, how do we know? How do we really know? Right? Because we're a smart species and we have all kinds of beliefs and things that we want to be true, how do we sort out the ones that we really should put our confidence in? The answer here is some sort of objectivism. Right? We need to use our experience and reason on the basis of that experience. And of course, that's what scientists do in very sophisticated fashion. But all of us in our lives need to practice these traits. Be as objective as we can in our experience, assessing the data, including the negative data, and trying to come up with our best understanding right, of it. What is it to be a human being? We've de-emphasized these ones. But the individualistic themes come out here in our understanding of human nature and the ethics that human beings are individuals. They should be autonomous. They have the capacity to think for themselves if they so choose to do so. Some debate over kind of the moral status, but largely a retreat from the idea of original sin, an idea that human beings are born either neutral or with some capacities for developing themselves to the good, a more under optimistic understanding of human beings. And then when we turn to political and economic issues, some sort of, broadly speaking, liberal capitalism comes to be the dominant right, set of views. Uh, when and where, those are just the uh, historical right, labels right, of the Enlightenment. So this is a five-dimensional definition of modernism. And if you want to understand right, philosophy, philosophy is tr traditionally divided into five disciplines, sometimes six. Right, what's the nature of reality? How do we know? What is it to be a human being? What should I do with my life? And how should we live together? Right, metaphysics, epistemology, human nature, ethics, and politics. Right, you have an integrated view on all of those things. That's your philosophy of life. This is the modernist right, view of life. That is radical, because if you contrast that to the pre-modern view, right, the pre-modern view emphasized supernaturalism. There is a realm that is superior to or beyond the natural world. And if you want to understand reality, that's where you start. In some sense, the natural world is derivative right, of a supernatural world. That ultimately, true knowledge comes from mystical insights that are directed to special prophets right, by God and or faith. We found a strong emphasis on the sinful nature of man, that human beings are not autonomous, but rather subjects. Right? And fundamentally, we should be obedient, right, both to our religious authorities and to the religious authorities who uh, carry, the, uh, carry the weight of God on earth. Uh, various networks of feudal obligation. I'm a member of this class, and so who I am and what is owed to me and what I owe to other people is defined by my class membership, and I have obligations of service and sacrifice with respect to other groups. And the point just is that between the pre-moderns and the moderns, that's the recognizable right, set of debates right, on all of these right, philosophical dimensions. And the postmoderns are going to say they're both wrong. This philosophy has failed. It, we tried that for 1,000 years. We've tried this one for 200 years. It also has failed. We need a third alternative. What is that going to be? All right, now let's go back to Foucault. All right. First point I want to make is the postmodernists, although I disagree with them, all of them are brilliant. All of them are deep. All of them are extraordinarily well-read particularly in the first generation postmodernists, the ones that I think are justifiably the names on everyone's lips when we need to talk about postmodernism. And the reason for that is that they go for the fundamentals. They really are drilling down to the deepest strata. So what is the deepest strata? Well, according to this light, or this chart rather, the most fundamental thing is this modernist belief in the importance and the efficacy of human reason. That that's how we acquire knowledge, 
If we really want to sort out the true from the false, we have to be sophisticated in the use of our rational capacity, logic, mathematics, scientific method, and so on. So Foucault, it is meaningless right, to speak in the name of right, or against reason, truth, or knowledge. Okay. Now, that's a big guns claim. Right? The entire Enlightenment project relies on a claim about reason. And the claim is going to be that that claim is not only false, but just meaningless. Reason is a meaningless concept. Truth right, is a meaningless concept. Knowledge is a meaningless concept. And one of the things that anecdotally we know when we start reading right, postmodern thinkers is there's a strong dose of skepticism right, and cynicism about any sort of positive value claim. One way uh, that this is done graphically right, is certain kind of success words epistemologically, right? Truth, right? Or fact, right? They're always put in scare quotes, right? And that's a way of distancing yourself from it. You know, I'm going to use this word truth, right? And then ha ha, right? That's the, the implicate. And this is where it's coming from. So what we do have in postmodernism is a very deep skepticism about the human capacity for knowledge. Right? And this is in contrast, right, to the claim that says, if we have faith, we can get knowledge. Or if we use reason, we can get knowledge. Both of those are going to be seen as false. There is no such thing as knowledge. Okay? We've been trying for a long time. We can't figure it out. Therefore, we should realize the game is up. Now, the point then is going to be, right? And I'm harping on this, right? Meaningless is a very strong claim, right? Poishman Framister, right? That's just a meaningless phrase. Right? And the claim is, when I say knowledge, that's no different from Poishman Matt Franister. Actually, I can't even say it twice, because I just made it up on the spot. Right? Just a meaningless nonsense phrase. And of course, that's just a breakdown of communication. And if we want to communicate with each other, we shouldn't be using meaningless words and phrases. And so the implication is going to be, whatever we're doing, we're not talking about knowledge. We're not talking about truth. And we should just kind of set those concepts aside and do something else. Now, what does that mean? Because that's out there. Well, Richard Rorty. Uh, try not to do death by PowerPoint, but this is another right, important right, quotation here. The difficulty faced by a philosopher who, like myself, is sympathetic to this suggestion, that is to say, what Foucault just said, that truth, knowledge, et cetera, are meaningless. As one who thinks of himself as auxiliary to the poet right, rather than to the physicist. Right, we'll pause there. Okay. When we were talking about the Enlightenment, we right, saying reason, scientific method, right, science, and so forth, that the job of the philosophers was to support and articulate to a large extent the whole scientific project that has transformed the world in the modern era. And what Rorty is suggesting here is that no, we shouldn't be thinking of that, right? Because what do scientists think they're doing? Right? They think they're studying the natural world and they're gathering facts, right? And they're doing logical interpretations and they're getting closer and closer to the truth, right, of things. And we're really getting knowledge, right, of the way the world works. But if Foucault is right, that's not what we're doing. Right? So we shouldn't be thinking of philosophers as working with physicists. And so he says, yeah, I said I'm going to think of myself as an auxiliary to the poet. As a philosopher, whatever that is, I'm working with the poets. And the poets and what the poets are doing is closer to, I can't quite use the word right, right or true, because that would be paradoxical. But that's where we need to be. Okay? Now, what's the difference between a physicist and a poet? Right? Well, if you put it in philosophical terms, right, the scientists say, we are trying to be objective. Right? I might really want something to be true. I might be emotionally invested in a theory, but if the facts and the logic and the evidence goes against my theory, I'm going to have to set aside my feelings and what I want to be true because I'm committed to objectivity. Right. But if you're a poet, right, what is your mode of operation? Right. Well, you just make whatever you feel up. Right? To put it crudely, right, you can make shit up. And that's fine. Because when you are doing poetry, you're expressing not necessarily a rational theoretical understanding of the world, but your subjective reaction to 
your circumstances, right, and the world, and you're putting it out there. And when I put my poem out there, your response to it is not, is this true, and does this meet the canons of scientific method? But rather, your reaction is, you know, does this push my emotional buttons in the right way and make me think and imagine things that I want to think and imagine? And so what Rorty is suggesting is, if we then set aside, as he thinks we must, the Enlightenment project, that means we are setting aside objectivity, that physics project, and instead we are enshrining subjectivity. And the poets are the most human realization of human subjectivity. Now, that's kind of paradoxical, right, because it sounds like we're saying the right way to think about the human condition right, is this way. But how can I talk about the right way without using the words truth? Right? I can't say that I know this. Right? And that's what he goes on to say. And this is the predicament right, that we are in. I have to do this without avoiding or hinting, rather, that my suggestion somehow gets things right, that my philosophy corresponds to the way things really are. because. As a skeptic, I can't know right, what things really are. All right. So we're going in this way, and we're using language to suggest some new territory, but we're aware of these pitfalls. OK. Stanley Fish, right. Duke University professor for a long time, uh, Milton scholar, uh, then actually moved to my state and became the highest paid public employee in the state of Illinois, made more than the governor as a superstar professor at one of the University of Illinois right, campuses. Talking here about deconstruction, he's uh, applying postmodern methods to literary uh, uh, criticism. And the label there for uh, deconstruction is a literary method of applying postmodern techniques to techniques. And the claim is to say, you know, these deconstructions really pretty great because it relieves me of the obligation to be right. I don't have to worry about being right, right. What does this text really mean? And am I interpreting it right correctly? And should I have arguments and good evidence right and so forth instead? of that objective right, criterion, deconstruction just says, I uh, just have to be interesting. Okay. And what's interesting? Well, that's deuces wild. That's subjective. Right? Right. And so you start to come up with creative right, interpretations of the text. And there are not these constraints. So literature studies are going to go in a certain direction. Okay. Frank Lentricchio is a colleague of Fishes while they were at Duke. Duke's university is very important right, to this postmodern story. Uh, and there's a fork in the road here, because for some postmodernists, it's just a matter of being playful and interesting and coming up with cool interpretations that push your value buttons, the fish option. But we also know that postmodernism has an agenda. Right? There is a politics right, at work, and this is what Lentricchia is going to argue here. He says, postmodernism, and this is now old news, seeks not to find the foundation and the conditions of truth. All right. So we're not interested in about the conditions of truth. Right. That's what Foucault told us we don't do anymore. Rorty right, agrees. Well, if we're not about truth, then what are we about? We are about exercising power for the purpose of social change. Okay. Truth is out. Power is in. And then he immediately applies this to the education, because he's a professor. He has students right, coming in on a regular basis. What should I be doing right, as a professor? Well, the entire ideal of liberal arts education right, is based on the Enlightenment vision. Every human being, including these young people who come into my classes, have the capacity for reasoning. And I have to expose them to the facts, lots of different experiences, and have lots of debates and discussions right, among the students and with me about the different ways we might interpret right, all of these facts and data. And we're going to put our interpretations up against the really smart people who've written the books that everybody, right, the, the other smart people, think that we should read. And the idea is we are training the hu individual human being's capacity for thinking for digesting their experience, for being open to new experience, to debate, changing their mind on all of the rhetoric and argument and so forth. That's what your job is as a professor, because that's what you think is the best way students can become truth seekers themselves and really come up with the kind of knowledge that they can rely on in their lives. But if all of that is out, what's left is power. My job as a professor, as he goes on to say, is to 
quote, help students spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time. So John Gray is right. We do live in the dim ruins of the enlightened world. It's all crap right out there. My job as a professor is to train activists. And I use my power to do that, recasting right, of education on postmodern lines.